now we're going to start part three of lecture 10. In your core reading is a paper about Tomnod, a project about disaster mapping, which is no longer running. There is a quote from a participant in it. They say they give what they have to give, which is the very beings. Participation means a lot to people. It's more than simply a donation, like cash for charity. What we're also seeing here is that volunteers are invested in the results of the project. Volunteers and researchers have a common goal. I'm a classic case of someone whose life was changed by citizen science. I found it more interesting than anything else I'd ever done. It's the reason I went back to university to study astrophysics. Although I failed it, I was also a public speaker about citizen science. That's how I got this job, and that's why I am speaking to you today. It's had a huge impact on my knowledge, interests, values, and the way I look at things. A high-achieving school student posted the Galaxy Zoo Forum that they felt humbled and had gained a new respect for other people and scientific discussion, and felt that they were a better person for it. This thread really struck a chord with other volunteers who had similar sentiments. I've been told some deeply moving stories by citizen scientists. For example, that their fellow volunteers are the best people they've ever met, and they didn't know how lonely they were before. That it gave them something to do, and this gave them hope. That it has motivated them to read a new book, or sign up to a new course, or to embark on some other big change in their life. Sometimes the impact is what people tell me in private or write about on a forum. Other times, the impact is palpable and the subject of news stories. A person might become a discoverer and make a big media splash. Or they might choose to go into research or study. In my case, I began giving talks to the general public and I moved to London to study a new course. There are a lot of papers about volunteer motivations, and I sometimes wonder, is that really the right question to ask? You don't ask again and again why someone is your colleague. You ask them what they need in order to do their best work. A powerful illustration, I think, was provided by Michael Pocock of the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. He did a citizen science project about diseases and parasites in trees. He found that people came along to the project if he used scary language, such as threats to our wildlife. But scare tactics did not keep people in that project. They were more likely to stay because of a common feeling of a love of nature. An example of not treating people as donors is not using marketing tactics, but working with people. The Tom Nod paper mentioned earlier shows something that's common to all citizen science projects. People want to know how they're doing. They want to know that it's useful. Volunteers want the same thing as the researcher wants. They're interested in the science and they want to make a difference. You and they will therefore work very well together if you tell them how the project is going. You might give feedback with regular blogs or newsletters or by automated answer checking, or by speaking with people, or by sharing scientific papers with them. It'll depend on the project. But if you don't tell them what's happening as a result of their work, they'll lose motivation. In fact, they might get quite upset and they might tell you or others so. Volunteers will usually be very interested in the science behind your project. They go through a learning process just to use the website and they don't want to stop there. This paper, which you'll find in your deep dive reading, identifies several ways in which people learn through doing citizen science. They might learn how to analyse the data, but also how to research the topic themselves or teach other people about it. They want to make learning fun. Galaxy Zoo volunteers enjoyed making artwork out of galaxies. They also wrote tutorials for new volunteers. There's an important quote in the blog in your core reading. If you can get your community, to build or create something together, something that is bigger than themselves, and critically, if you can make it fun, you are likely to get people engaged. In the Galaxy Zoo Forum, people did their own research on astronomical objects and wrote about them for each other. This resulted in the creation of several new areas of the forum. 
Citizen scientists will want to talk to you. They want to know what you do, what it's like to be a scientist, what it's like to go exploring and observing. The paper in the second quote shows that volunteers really appreciate the opportunity to talk directly with professionals, but professionals often aren't willing. This is a great shame, because scientists often complain about how the media present too simple a narrative of what science is really like and what results can mean. And many people who are not scientists don't have the confidence to pick themselves as one. If you can spend time with your volunteers, do. We saw earlier that it took a large number of people to discover the pea galaxies and several different skill sets put together to work out what was happening. We also saw earlier that people come to citizen science with their own problems. Both these needs are fulfilled by providing something very simple, a relaxed and respectful place to chat. People will have a lot more confidence if they can have a laugh together, get some help and risk getting things wrong. Michael Nielsen, who wrote a book about open science you'll find in your deep dive reading, talks about micro expertise, where each person has some small unique thing to contribute. Add up many types of micro expertise and you'll end up with a comprehensive whole of knowledge. For this to happen, people need to be comfortable, so they need a place in which they can talk to each other. As researchers, we might decide that we have an ethical responsibility to our volunteers or a code of ethics. We don't have to solve their problems, but we do have a duty of care and respect. At this point, I want you to consider an ethical problem. An early sister project of Galaxy Zoo showed people pictures of animals in Africa taken with automatic cameras. They had a very important ethic, do not waste volunteers time. Sometimes the camera took pictures of blowing grass, so there was no animal to classify. Waste of time, right? So we should remove those pictures. But when they removed the pictures, they found that people's engagement decreased. If every picture is exciting, no picture is exciting. Similarly, let's say we've got some great artificial intelligence that will automatically classify easy galaxies and save the weirder ones for the public. That's efficient, right? The public will only get weird pictures. But if every picture is weird, no picture is weird. What should you do? Do you show people everything and keep things interesting? Or do you only show them a specialist subset in order to not waste their time? <laughs>